We're so lucky to have uh, top flight editor, Dan Leventhal, ACE. Dan's early career started in music videos before moving on to features, and we're talking big features. Um, Iron Man 1 and 2, Spider-Man Homecoming, Thor, Ant-Man, to name a few. Uh, he has also found the time to invent an editing app for the iPad called Touch Edit. Um, so Dan, I'd like to just, you know, to talk about your career and, uh, you know, cutting big studio effects driven features is probably uh, different than many of us are used to. Um, I imagine it's like being the captain of a ship and you've got a big team to manage. Can you tell us about the, uh, what it looks like? Yeah, they're on, on a big show like uh, like you know all the superhero movies. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a pretty big crew. Generally, I have uh, about a dozen positions under me, and uh, we work closely with the uh, effects departments too. So, um, and the difference between a, a big effects driven picture and a, and a non effects driven picture is that it's kind of like the cart comes before the horse because it takes so much lead time to do effects that you have to start putting them in play before you figure it out the movie. So you have to kind of uh, start with like, a, like you would do a puzzle and, and start by putting in the things you are pretty darn sure are gonna go in and then your uh, guessing percentage goes down from there. So uh, that's one of the main things. Well, on the uh, big effects uh, movies, it must be like a sea of green. You have characters on green screen before the effects. You have to decide what material you're going to use before you send it out to VFX. What's that like? Well, the process generally starts before me with a, a department called pre-visualization or pre -vis. I don't know how familiar you guys are with this, but what it is is they'll do a, a, a kind of a rudimentary animation of everything uh, that's going to happen based on the script and the storyboards. Then we inherit this. We might cut it for them, uh, the editor or, or editors if there's more time. And then as they shoot, they're first going to shoot the background plates, meaning if uh, Iron Man's flying through the frame, what's the, what's the background he's flying through or Spider-Man swinging? So then they'll get that stuff and everything that happens there. Then uh, they'll shoot the foregrounds against green, like the actor on wires or whatever it is. And then um, we'll slap those things together and um, start the whole process of, of, of uh, telling the story. And then as soon as we get enough uh, information, we send it on to the effects houses to actually do the real work. What are your schedules like in some of the pictures you work on? Shorter and shorter. That's um, I, I'm usually on a picture um, nine to sixteen months, depending depending uh, um, how rushed the schedule is. When I do Marvel films, they tend to um, give us a release date before they've started writing the script. So uh, the one I'm on now has a, has a very aggressive schedule. Is there much uh, change that happens in the whole process? I mean, do you? have as much freedom as an editor or on these kind of pictures is it all pretty much to the book and you're just trimming and there's no book there's no. everything is handmade and uh, I think all pictures are handmade I think what you guys do is handmade that's the beauty of our business is that there's no cookie cutter to do anything so they you know you use the script as your guideline but it's only going to get you so far because as I said they've they've put a release date before they've written the script and there are writers on the entire shoot, and then there'll be writers in post-production because we have to start reinventing parts of the story that were more interesting and get rid of the stuff that wasn't working very well. So then we have to find ways to bridge everything. So it's, it's some sort of a controlled chaos, basically. Uh, Does the director have as much control in a big picture like that, or is it by committee of studio heads? Well, the, the director has all sorts of control, but there's also the studio is very active. The, the director has to, you know, get us close to the goal line, basically. And, um, and we, we have to get him close as editors to the goal line. So I always say that if we don't get past the 80th percentile before he's even come in to start, we're in big trouble because we don't have time to recut everything or re 
redo it. There's just not the time. So we have to do our thing. He has to do his thing. Then it opens up uh, to the bosses, and they're only going to work from what they're seeing, from what's working or isn't working. And uh, or they'll have other considerations, like they they don't really appreciate movies being two and a half hours long because they lose a, a, a screening, basically one less screening a day, so it, it's box office. But there's, there's lots of considerations. Um, you know, People say, well, do you have any say on anything? I have no say on anything. But <laughs> the truth is that I have no say, but as I said, a huge amount of the decisions were made by me alone at, at a certain point, and they said, okay, that works, let's, let's go with it. It's just the nature of the beast. And then I have to, you know, basically be selfless, put all ego aside, and listen. And what, what they're asking for, um, or try to give them, even if they don't know how to articulate it. So you have to kind of uh, read the tea leaves a little bit. You have to be a diplomat. Yeah. And that's why they hire you, because you're good at this. They don't pay me to edit, let me just say that. <laughs> now, um, I, I imagine it's like, DPs or actors or anybody in this business, you tend to get typecast. Now you have a really, you know, high level that you're typecast at, which is terrific. But do you ever wish you could sometimes do a small character-driven movie? Uh, of course. I mean, the grass is always greener. We all. I mean, Oscar season's upon us, and it drives me up the wall because we we you know our task is really hard, especially if there's action and comedy and effects. There's a lot to do, but it's not stuff that's recognized. Um, but, you know, those of us that work these extreme hours and have ex-wives know that we have to keep doing it. <laughs> Can you tell us about Touch Edit? Well, I, I just, uh, when the iPad came out, I fell in love with it and thought there might be something to, to touch. I, I envisioned um, a future where we start being um, mobile and we, we start losing the traditional editing room. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's a really good idea and I, I got this thing out much to the amazement of people that actually knew anything about this stuff. So I went through coders around the world and I think I started with a budget of $40,000 and spent a quarter million just to get it out. But, um, and I'm very, very proud of it and I think it, it's about the vision is right, it's just about 10 years too early. So I think eventually the editing room will go away and we'll edit in communities and different places. So I, I don't get to use my own uh, creation very much, mostly because of security actually. They want to have everything tight under the, uh, under the watchful eye. <laughs> well, how about um, the tools that you do use? What kind of platforms do you edit on? Well, you know, these are big pictures, so we use Avid Media Composers because they're, we're, we are, even with those, we're putting them to the test every day when you have a dozen systems operating simultaneously on the same servers, and uh, you just, it just has to be robust. And, and, you know, the further down the show gets, the more stuff comes in. Uh, sometimes some of these effects have 120 iterations before so, so you can just see the, the media stacking up and everyone, you know, uh, stepping over themselves. And there hasn't proven any other, uh, anything robust enough to handle that kind of load other than the media composer all these years. So we, we'd like to kick them in the butt and make them better, but they're still the best, so. Well, a lot of people would admire where you're at and there's never any one path, but what would you tell somebody if they were interested in having a career like yours? Where, where should they go to, to scratch see, at the heels? See, see your clergyman first. <laughs> uh, Say a prayer. Yeah, uh, you know, there's, um, there's, a, there's always a bit of luck involved in everything, but there's a bit of making yourself really ready for whatever opportunities come your way. And I thought that I was very lucky early on in actually learning an important lesson about um, what it is to be a professional because at the beginning, you actually may know more than the people you're working with, but if you have professional demeanor, life can surprise you. I, I was in music videos and, and started doing videos for these 19-year-old twins named the Hughes Brothers. 
two years later, they took me to edit movies. And, and they said, you're the first person who ever treated us with any respect. So just know that whoever you're working with could be the next Spielberg for all you know, you know? So uh, you, have to, you have to have that kind of demeanor and you know, treat everyone, not just above you well, but treat everyone below you well, because it's, it's always changing. Yeah, we um, interviewed uh, Russell Carpenter, ASC, and uh, he had a very similar um, kind of ethos to, to tell us about. Uh, and that reminds me of Ant-Man. Ant-Man must have been interesting, especially because of the perspective. Was that difficult in the editing? Yeah, well, uh, we had to discover things. And one of the things we discovered was that uh, you know, to to the the whole fun of it was that they could, you know, the guy could shrink tiny, and you couldn't use superhero angles. You couldn't use that camera a little low and right. look at it betrayed scale. It, and so you had to kind of reinvent the language. And we discovered it early enough to send the you know <laughs> wave the flags. Hey, s stop shooting the stuff like this. It's not going to work. And um, and it was great. Russell shot that, and he would he his footage was beautiful. Um, yeah, so each one of these, you think it's a cookie cutter, you think if we're doing a Marvel film, they're the same, but that is not how any of these are approached and not by the bosses, and that's why they're so successful. Because what they're really trying to do is work in all sorts of genres, but keeping it within the context of the Marvel Universe. And I didn't see any of this. When I did Iron Man, I thought it was a one and done. In fact, when John Favreau uh, called me and said, "Hey, we're going to do Iron Man," I, I thought, "Really, that Black Sabbath song? They're really going to do a movie <laughs> about that song?" I said, "Great," because I never had any comic book. Now I've done the scores of these. <laughs> yeah. Well, do a great job in Ant Man, especially. That was a, a really oh, terrific movie, you. well cut and shot. And, um, really appreciate your time coming. Is there anything else you'd want to add to share with people? Um, yeah, I mean, you know. For those of us who are lifers, uh, we're very institutionalized and we, you have to love it. And you, you can't fake loving it because there's too much of a grind. So if, if, uh, if you're someone who, who you know, says, well, it sucks because it's a job, but I don't know what else I would do, um, then, then maybe you could be <laughs> following the footsteps here a little bit. You have to have the passion. Yeah, you have to have the passion. Thank you so much, Tom. All right. Quite welcome. Sure.